So thanks for joining us. This is the seventh session in our hydrography webinar series. Uh, my name is Steve Achel. Uh, host Al Ray will also be uh, helping out some of the host duties for this call. Uh, Sue Budo, our WBD coordinator, will also be uh, helping out with the Q&A session later on today. Um, sorry for the delay and for the new phone number. We actually had a we had so many people register for this. We had to uh, change. Uh, teleconference technologies uh, late, in, late in the day yesterday, so we're getting some things sorted out here. Uh, so, so the purpose of these calls is to really get uh, to, a lot of an opportunity to share some success stories and share information about uh, using the National Hydrography data set, the watershed boundary data set, and other products that come about uh, from those data sets in, in a forum more or less like a uh, like a conference or seminar setting. Um, today we have two talks, uh, one from Dan Isaac with the U.S. Forest Service, sorry about that, I'm not sure where that went, uh, about building a national stream internet, and um, a second session uh, from, from Howard Reeves with the, Michigan, the USGS Michigan Water Science Center, um, talking about integrating hydrography and fisheries data to assess ecological flows. Uh, that's in the context of uh, some work on uh, the Great Lakes Basin Compact and Environmental Flow Frameworks. Um, between sessions, we will have a Q&A, uh, but because of the phone bridge and the risk of somebody putting us on mute and hearing Muzak for an hour and a half and having to cancel things and make, th make that up, uh, everyone, is spe everyone is in uh, lecture mode. That means we use the Q&A tab within the WebEx to uh, convey questions to the speakers and then Al and Sue uh, will read those off. Uh, that's also helpful because it gives us a written transcript of those things which we will publish to the web later on. Um, and then at the end of the session, stick around for the poll. We have just three simple questions for you uh, related to this session and uh, content for future sessions. Uh, if you want information on the seminar series, uh, visit the website. Uh, this seminar will be posted there, uh, including a video, a transcript, uh, the questions and the PowerPoints, uh, as well as all the previous sessions uh, are also posted to the website. If you're interested in more NHD WBD news, uh, send an email to the link there and we'll get you on the newsletter list. Um, and otherwise, uh, we plan to do at least one more of these before going on summer break here. Uh, we plan to do one April 28th, um, same time. So, uh, with that, I'm going to pass the ball to Dan Isaac, and we'll hear about National Stream Internet. Okay, you Please check your mute button. Okay. Um, I just click share my screen, and can you hear me okay? We can. Okay. Let's see, we'll get this set up. Okay, um, thank you, Steve and Al, for the invitation to participate in this webinar series. It's great to see that level of uh, interest and enrollment in today's webinar. And so I'm going to talk about um, building a national stream internet. The, ba the basic idea behind this is to try to create a generalizable and flexible analytical infrastructure that is specific to data measured on stream networks. Um, and before I get too far into that, I, I do want to also acknowledge my co-authors on this project. Aaron Peterson, who is a spatial stream ecologist with the Queensland University of Technology over in Australia. Dave Nagel, who is our geospatial analyst and, and lead here in the Boise Aquatic Sciences Lab out in Idaho that has handled many of the geotechnical aspects of this project. Jay Verhoof, who is a biometrician with uh, NOAA, the um, Marine Mammal Lab up in uh, Fairbanks, Alaska. And then Jeff Kirshner, who is a fish biologist with uh, USGS, um, recently retired. And this also then is a project that was funded um, through the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's Landscape Conservation Cooperatives. They had a national um, initiative RFP a few years ago, and, and this was one of the two projects um, that that um, particular outreach funded. And, and, and the motivation or, or the possibility of, of this, this stream internet and, and, and creating 
new and, and valuable types of information for the nation's aquatic resources basically emerges from the fact that there is so much data out there already. Um, hundreds of different agencies have, have spent hundreds of millions of dollars collecting data on water quality attributes, biological attributes, habitat condition, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the fact that those data exist opens, opens the world to, to just a giant array of possibilities if we can build a system that allows us to tap the information out of those databases. And so we, before we get too much further along in terms of uh, what we're going to talk about today, I do need to give you know, kind of a concrete definition to this otherwise fuzzy concept of a stream internet. And so, so this is kind of what we've come up with for describing this. And it's a network of people, databases, digital information systems, and analytical techniques that interact synergistically to create and communicate massive amounts of information efficiently. And, and there's a variety of different things then that, that go into that. First of which is just people on landscapes from those, those many different agencies that are interested in aquatic resources collecting data on all manner of different things. Ideally, they're, they're using standard protocols that are um, replicable by, by other groups that are also interested in those attributes. And then we want to have that data flowing into open access comprehensive databases so that it's usable, um, not just by the folks that collect it at one point in time for one particular study, but also that it you know, can serve as an archive that we can tap into um, later as, as additional ideas come around about how to use information. And, and thirdly then, you know, analysis and extracting information from those databases. And so if you can build intercompatibility amongst all these pieces, then you, you can you know, kind of complete the loop here where that new information that's being developed from those big databases then ultimately flows back to people um, making decisions about um, conserving and managing resources on the landscape so that they can do their jobs more efficiently. And you just build an iterative loop here so, so that um, you know, the next set of data they collect in is, is going to be collected more efficiently in places where we don't already have it, et cetera, et cetera. And so, so intercompatibility amongst all those things is really important if, if you're going to assemble the, this larger system from component parts. And so next, I just want to kind of step through what some of those key components are. First of which is the National Hydrography data set itself. And so the fact that, um, you know, Al and, and Tommy DeWald and, and others have been working on, on this particular project for uh, my understanding is almost a couple decades now to build a nationally consistent stream network geodatabase is, is just the, the, a huge thing and it's, it's the foundation that everything else that, that we're um, trying to do here rests upon. Um, and so I don't need to tell folks on, on this webinar more about this, but, but um, it, it's absolutely key to being able to pull this whole thing off. Second part of that then that, that's really important for us in terms of uh, thinking about building models or predicting um, the things uh, about stream networks that we want to better understand is the plus part of NHD. And, and the fact that each unique REACH ID then also has associated with it a set of um, nationally um, consistently derived REACH descriptors, so things like elevation, slope, land use, et cetera, et cetera. Now, these are the, the value added attributes in the NHD plus um, framework. Um, that, that's just a huge thing because those are the sorts of things that we would often use as predictor variables in a model uh, of stream temperature or species distribution. And, and the fact that those are all done and we can draw on those um, greatly accelerates um, other aspects of this work. There's also other groups now that have um, you know, pulled together databases of these REACH descriptors. So uh, um, that Wang et al. group with, with the National Fish Habitat Assessment a few years ago. And then more recently, um, Hill et al. just published the um, StreamCat database, um, an EPA-funded effort to, to again, build uh, a consistent set of REACH descriptors that are tied to um, NHD um, plus version 2 in, in that particular case. The third component of, of a national stream internet then is just those mountains of data that already exist, whether you're talking about temperature or discharge or water quality parameters or species distributions, genetic um, attributes. There are literally tens of thousands of unique stream sites across the country where these sorts of things ha have been measured. And, and I would argue that we are literally only scratching the surface of the amount of information that resides within those, those databases. And so we want to build a system that allows us to tap that information out of what already exists. 
fourth component then, and this is a key one, is, is having statistical models that are actually specific to data measured on stream networks. And so th this seems a little bit odd at first that you know we're, we're we're fitting models all the time, right? So so it's not that we don't have models, but the vast majority of things that we're applying to um, stream systems, at least in when we're looking at empirical statistical models, those were developed originally for terrestrial systems. Th those don't account for or even acknowledge that the stream network exists. And so um, you. To, to really optimize the, the type of inference that, that you're going to draw from these sorts of data sets, you, you want to have models that are designed to work um, with them. And so that's a lot of the work that Aaron Peterson and Jay Verhoof have done over the last decade or so, is to basically build that class of statistical model. Um, and so Jay's a, a, a you know, statistician, biometrician. He's published a lot of the theory for these, these models now in the statistical um, literature. And Aaron has worked closely with him to translate that into um, geospatial scripts and, and other forms of software so that it's more accessible. And so there's a nice set of uh, uh, software that goes with this and, and runs in um, R. And I guess, too, that the origins of a lot of this work actually date back, oh, probably 15 or so years ago to uh, an old EPA star map grant. And so this is um, work that funded Erin to do her dissertation research uh, on the flows project, the func functional linkage of watersheds and streams that has just kind of continued on in subsequent iterations to get to where we are today. And so just a little bit more about those models. Um, that their key innovation is, is having that covariant structure that is based on network topology. So, so the models understand the direction of flow, they understand tributary confluences and, and the differential um, weighting that a small stream has relative to Um, and, and so the, the other thing that the, these models can do is because they are spatial statistical models, they can account for autocorrelation or, or the clustering in um, large aggregated databases that you might pull together from multiple sources. That sort of thing is, is really problematic to deal with um, unless you're running a spatial model that doesn't understand the spatial um, coordinates of, of where things are collected in space. These models can work with that, and, and actually that, that's one of the things that goes into allowing them to make better predictions than, than some of the um, traditional non-spatial models. Um, there's a, a website then that has this information online, so if, if you're just, you want to start playing around and, and gather familiarity with running these models, just do a Google search on SSN and STARS and, and that'll pop up. This, this website, there, there's software that, that you can download, um, example data sets, and lots and lots of documentation. And, and two, last thing then about these models, I just, just want to point out that these are you know, a, a basic generalizable class of statistical model. Um, there, there's, there's nothing here that's inherently um, specific to using it for just stream temperature applications, like, like I'm going to show here in subsequent slides. These are just a general branch of statistics. Um, like any other branch of statistics, it's just that they're tuned up to, to work with these stream data sets. And so you can model all these different attributes and you can model them using different link functions, whether that's a Gaussian a distribution, Poisson distribution, or binomial distribution. So, so the fifth important component then to the NSI is having a, a network that is tuned specifically to work with these SSN models. Um, I mentioned that, that we're building everything off of that NHD um, hydrography layer, but at the same time, the, it, the way it was developed, it, it wasn't done so specifically for these SSN models. And one of the things that um, the, these network models need is to have connectivity throughout the, the full network and, and have unique flow paths. And so one, one of the, the biggest, I guess, value-added new thing that we did as part of this project was, was to go through um, the NHD plus version 2 hydrography layer for the lower 48 states and recondition it slightly such that we can maintain those unique flow paths. And so things like um, uninitiated flow, braids and diverging flow, et cetera, et cetera. You see the list there. We, we basically had to go in and do some slight modifications to that. And the specific modifications that we did are all well described in the user's guide that um, Dave Nagel developed that has kind of the metadata on how those adjustments were made. Um, key though, we, we did want to make sure that we maintained back compatibility with NHD Plus so that once someone does an SSN analysis, 
um, using this NSI network, they can then take the results of that and, and map those back onto the NHD Plus um, network. So, you, so you're not losing anything by um, going off and doing these SSN models. Six components then are having killer apps, the sorts of things that, that people um, want to get better information about and that these models potentially um, offer ways of, of getting much better information than we've had in the past. So, so there's just a whole laundry list of things that, that can be done with these SSN models, things like parameter estimation and significance testing, you know, lots of statistical models can do that. These SSN models, especially when, when applied with dense data sets, um, will generate more accurate um, parameter estimates and, and um, you know, correct statistical significance levels. You can use the models then once you've got a model fit to make predictions at unsampled locations throughout a, a stream network. So if you want to make a, a status assessment and just an, an accurate map of what things look like across a larger area, they, they do that very well. Efficient monitoring designs that account for that, that directionality of, of flow and proportional weighting of different stream sizes. Um, that there's a paper that looks at that specifically and then how you can use this sort of uh, SSN framework for that. Block creeging to make um, predictions or comparisons between reference and, and control sites um, so, so that you can um, do an apples to apples comparison to look at how maybe watershed conditions affect water quality versus some reference site. Fish population estimates at large scales can be done with block creeging. And then one of the really powerful applications, and I'll show an example of this here next, is mining big data databases. So because these models can account for spatial autocorrelation among sites, and, and that doesn't degrade their performance, the more data you load into the models, the better they are. And that, that allows you then to aggregate data from, from many existing sources. Um, and, and a lot of these different applications then are described in that Isaac et al. Um, applications uh, paper that, that we provide the reference for at the bottom of that page. So just an example then uh, of how uh, we might go about mining uh, a big data database. One of the, the flagship projects that, that we've been building using um, the NHD network and, and these SSN models is this NorWest project, which is an attempt to build an integrated interagency stream temperature database across 100 different agencies in the western United States and then basically use those information or the, those data sets to um, create a set of interpolated high resolution stream temperature climate scenarios so that different agencies have that information then for planning purposes. And we're fairly well along in, in this project. Actually, by the end of this year, we'll, we'll have completed the entirety of the Western United States. At present, this database has more than 150 million hourly temperature records in it, um, copies of data that already existed that people sent to our database team so we could um, forge it in, into one usable database. There are more than 20,000 unique stream sites represented in this database. And if you want to go out and just collect that much data from scratch, it would cost something on the order of $10 million. But, but the fact that we can pull this data together from existing sources at a relatively low cost using a small database team allows us then to start um, adding significant value to, to what already is out there. And, and on top of just that value of, of the raw data then is going to be all the information that, that flows out of, of these um, databases once we start fitting accurate models to them. And, and that's harder to put a price tag on, but it, it's got to have a multiple that is many times that um, $10 million figure that it would cost to collect the raw data. So this is just comparison then, these two graphs uh, of fitting a traditional non-spatial, non-stream model to a big temperature data set for several river basins within the western United States that have a lot of data. And the bottom graph there then shows the fitting the spatial SSN models to that same data set. And you can see that there's a big gain in predictive um, accuracy and performance of the models with the same data set once you apply these, these spatial models to them. Um, and typically, you know, these, these aggregated databases, we, we've got um, you know, around an R square of 0.9 and, and an average prediction error of about one degree centigrade. And then the predictor variables that are used in the model then uh, are listed there on the left. Those are all things that, that come off of nationally um, you know, available pre-existing geospatial um, databases, things out of um, you know, the NHD network, the StreamCat um, database, et cetera, et cetera. So it's basically just a mapping exercise once we get to this point of, of having an organized database that we can work with and reference against those geospatial layers. 
And this map then is just, just kind of the end result of going through that process of building the database, linking it to NHD plus and, and the coverts, and, and then modeling it and using the SSN model so we can interpolate amongst those, those observation um, locations. Uh, this is the thermal scape across a big chunk of the western United States. And, and we've got that information then at a high resolution throughout that, that full stream network. Um, we, we've got the model set to make predictions at, at one kilometer resolution, and, and we can do that now across more than a million kilometers of rivers and streams. And the last part of, of what we do in, in this project, but, but many of the others that we're doing now routinely, is we'll build a custom website to deliver that database and, and the interpolated um, scenario maps out to the user community. And so we've also got a NorWest um, website where, where people go to get that information. And, and this gets heavily used because the data that went into it um, were contributed by the people that are trying to, to address a whole range of questions um, related to temperature and climate change and regulatory standards um, out there on the landscape. And so these, these are just some examples of the ways in which people use um, the data and the uh, um, temperature scenarios that they can get from the website. Uh, and so just, just to kind of wrap up here and kind of circle back again to this, this broader concept or idea of, of a streaming internet, um, you know, the project what was fairly straightforward. We, we had three simple um, objectives that we were trying to achieve. First of which, what was just developing compatibility between these SSN uh, spatial stream analysis tools and the NHD layer. That was, that was done and completed um, sometime earlier this year. We also then hosted a national workshop about a year ago um, here in Boise. Al was part of that. We also tried to get leaders from um, other national aquatic um, programs with, with the different federal agencies that, that have a broad kind of mission and vision to what they're doing, as well as engaging key researchers in just a discussion about the possibility of what can now come out of these existing um, technologies and data sets. And thirdly, then, we're, we're working to develop a grassroots user base with the technical skills to apply these tools. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But, but the hope is, um, by, by having done some of the on-the-ground geospatial work um, throughout different parts of the country now, we can make um, um, these sorts of big data mining projects like NorWest a lot easier for, for other groups in the country to do, and that there are going to be incentives um, now that exist for aggregating um, databases or data, smaller data sets into larger databases that we can use to extract information from once people see all the possibilities. And so, so we've got um, a website now that, that's um, been launched in association with the, the National Stream Internet Project. There's a lot of different components here and things I've talked about today. And, and basically, the, the website is meant to kind of act as a portal that pulls those different things together. We've got some of the information there from um, the workshop that we did, the presentations that were given um, last year. We've got the um, geospatial layers for that NSI hydrography network that is a slightly modified version of the NHD version 2 network. So if people want to download that, they can grab the information there. And then we also provide links out to um, databases of stream reach descriptors um, that, that different groups have developed. So things like the stream cat database or um, the, the Wang et al. Um, database was developed for um, the national um, fish habitat group assessment a few years ago. We basically, because all those things have their own websites, but we're just providing a way to link to those so that other users that aren't familiar with the fact that those exist, if they come to NSI, NSI website, they, they then can link out to and find those resources. And then also stream uh, databases of stream measurement. So, so there's a lot of data that, that is being pulled together and organized by, by different groups kind of as we go through this process. These are just a couple examples of the large measurement databases now that, that exist for different parts of the country. Um, this Western Center for, for Monitoring Assessment and Freshwater Ecosystems is run out of Logan, and they've got thousands and thousands of sites where, where macroinvertebrates have been measured in, in streams across the country. Um, same thing with, with Maris, this multi-state aquatic resources information system. Um, you know, basically, again, millions of observations that are georeferenced, that are available online. There are websites where people can go to download that information um, and to start thinking about how you might use that with these other technologies to build better models. 
And the last thing or, or the major thing that, that we do uh, on the website is just kind of keep uh, real-time, up-to-date bibliography of different studies that have applied these SSN models so that as this evolves um, going forward, people can go to this bibliography and, and access the, those um, different applications of the models to get a better sense of the um, different ways that the user community is now applying these technologies. And, and lastly then, just trying to grow that, that user community. Um, we, we launched the website, the SSN and STARS website for the soft, for the statistical software a little over three years ago. We get about 10,000 visits a year to that website now and people are in there downloading um, the software and, and um, example data sets, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, it, so it is fairly popular. And we also then host annual training workshops in Boise where we have um, Aaron come over from Australia and Jay comes down from Fairbanks. And then um, you know, people across the country that are interested in, in um, applying these models um, you know, we'll travel here for, for a several day um, workshop where, where they just get to work hands on with Aaron and Jay to better understand the statistical code and, and link these different components to their data sets so they can start to model them for a variety of purposes. And, and at this point then, we kind of are to the point where a lot of the, um, you know, the heavy lifting has been done to make um, using these models and, and linking that to the NHD network as easy as is possible to do. The last step really is just for, for people that are interested to you know, build the, those databases that they want to model for anything anywhere in the country and, and just have at it. Once they've got the technical expertise to do this stuff, then um, they, can, they can take the ball and run from there is our hope. And kind of the vision motivating all of this then is um, what we call TSI or total stream information through the NSI. And, and the hope is that and maybe a few years down the road, as these things get to be used more and more frequently, you could literally throw a dot at, at any part of the country and, and wherever, wherever that dart landed on a stream reach, you would have a, a precise prediction of the water quality attributes that are there, a statistical confidence interval on that. You would know something about the biology and all the other things that, that make that particular reach of stream a cool thing for, for aquatic critters and something that we're interested in as a nation in terms of managing and conserving our aquatic resources. And I think that's all I've got. Okay, thanks, Dan. Um, we are. We did start a couple minutes late, so we may just do. We'll just do a question or two uh, for Dan while we switch presentations to uh, Howard Reeves. If you do have a question for Dan, use the Q and A button uh, at the top of the WebEx window. Um, you should be able to uh, enter enter questions in through there, and then uh, Al and Sue will take care of that. Um. Okay. So the Q and A panel. Uh, it moves around, so when <laughs> all right. It's uh, but right now we're not seeing any questions in there. Um, so Dan, I just wanted to see just maybe if you could clarify a little bit about the the network and how. So you you had to make some modifications to the um NHD plus um stream network to make it work with the statistics that you have. And then um just wanted you to comment maybe on how you link back to the NHD uh network from that from the modified network. Right. So um pro probably the best thing to do, I mean the protocols are all documented in that NSI user's guide. Um, and as far as you know, the technical details, that, that's really something that Dave Nagel here in our shop, you know, he's the, he's the person to talk to about that. I, I could take a swing at it, but I would, I'm sure, um, flounder and, and not be as accurate as, as I probably should be. So I, I would direct you to those resources. So if we have time for one more question, Dan, um, the NHC Plus, uh, this, the questioner believes is 1 to 100K resolution. Has any work been done with the high res NHD, the 1 to 24K data? So a person can use the, these SSN models with, with a stream network that comes from, you know, lots of different sources. It can be the, the 1 to 24K. It can be a synthetic network that's derived from a digital elevation model. We, we chose the NHD plus network in the 1 to 100,000K, um, you know, 
because of the fact that there are those reach coverts that are already built and, and linked to every reach in the country. And, and that just makes you know, the modeling and then the mapping of the predictions from the model so much easier than if you have to build those coverts yourself that um, that's kind of the, the default strategy that, that we've taken. Um, but, but people aren't locked into having to use that, but it's just going to be more work to use um, some of these other stream networks at least until the, the 1 to 24K um, version of NHD Plus that Al and, and Tommy and the development team are working on becomes broadly available. And at, at that point, we would then probably migrate what we're doing over to the, the 1 to 24K. Okay, uh, great. Thanks. Um, so, Dan, I'll just mention, this is Al Ray, and um, I'll mention that we are working on a high-resolution NHD Plus um, we're just getting started in production on that. Um, we hope to have um, around a half a dozen um, hydro regions of data done this fiscal year, um, and so we should we should have some sample data for people to look at pretty soon. Uh, nationally, it's going to be a year or two at least before we have that done, but we will have something very similar for the high resolution NHD. Uh, soon. All right. So thanks, Dan. Thanks, Al. Uh, we're going to move to Howard Reeves uh, and get uh, see his presentation, and then we'll use whatever the balance of the hour is for questions about either. Okay. So take it away, Howard. All right. Thanks, Steve. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Great. Um, I'm going to build a little bit on what Dan just presented, and rather than showing the background data, Show some applications that we were involved with here in Michigan and then broader in, into the Great Lakes Basin. So uh, one thing that's happened in the last 10 years or so was that the Great eight Great Lakes states passed the Great Lakes St. Lawrence River Basin Compact, which is an interstate compact, and it has a companion international agreement with the two provincial Canadian provinces. Um, and in that agreement, in the compact, the states and provinces uh, pledged to, uh, in that last bullet, prevent adverse resource impacts from new or increased water withdrawals. Uh, they all, there are some other uh, features in terms of water conservation and efficiency, but I want to focus on this, on this last bullet here, adverse resource impact. Each of the jurisdictions got to define what they meant by adverse resource impact. So, In Michigan, what was done was to use a system similar to what Dan outlined that combined stream, inf stream information, water temperature information, and ecological information in terms of what the fish species presence and abundance was to define an adverse resource impact in terms of Will the water withdrawal that you're proposing change the characteristic fish populations at any point in the state? So it to, to implement this uh, assessment process under the compact, we had to combine these three models, the stream flow model, somehow to determine what the flow is at ungauged reaches across the state, a uh, community model, what kind of fish are present everywhere, and then how does that community respond as, as the stream flows are changed? And then a withdrawal model to uh, relate either surface water withdrawals or groundwater withdrawals to changes, changes in stream flow. You can imagine that a surface water withdrawal is pretty simple, just directly removes uh, water from that stream, but a groundwater withdrawal would be distributed in space, maybe among multiple streams, and delayed in time, so we want to know uh, what, the, what the impact of the pumping is uh, on stream flow. In terms of the uh, NHD and the NHD Plus, those provided the, the background data framework to build these withdrawal models and then subsequently serves as the data, as the data structure for the legislation that was ultimately passed in Michigan in 2008. So that NHD Plus, as Dan outlined, 
brought in some information about the catchments associated with each NHC reach. And those, that information was used in regression models to make estimates of stream flow. And they're also used to make estimates of stream temperature. It related individual measurements of fish to uh, fish models that would predict fish presence and abundance across the state. And then it feeds finally into a accounting system so that any withdrawal can be accounted for is how it, how it impacts the streams as they move downstream across the state. One of the key steps in the implementation in Michigan was to classify streams to recognize that all streams are different as you move across the state. And we ended up with 11 different classes based on size and temperature. And this plot is illustrating this area of Michigan is dominated by warm streams that are um, runoff dominated. And the upper part of the lower peninsula of Michigan is dominated by uh, base flow groundwater fed streams that have cold and cool water. And the state legislature and the, and the scientific advisory panels that helped um, put this or recommend what this uh, legislation wanted to make sure that we treated these systems differently between the, the famous trout streams of the upper part of the lower peninsula of Michigan and uh, runoff dominated streams in other parts of the state. To build the response curves for how a, the fish community would change based on stream flow changes, I put this flow chart in here just to highlight the amount of data and the different kinds of data that go into this decision making. So there's, there's stream temperature data, there's, there are fish surveys, there's information from the NHC and the WBD in terms of what, what's the area associated with the streams, what are the, uh, what's the surface geology, what are the other landscape characteristics that go in that are associated with each stream uh, reach. And then that fundamental data, which is very similar to the stream internet that Dan Isaacs just outlined, could then be used to build the models as he, as he discussed, and then finally to provide outputs that were then used um, to make decisions. In Michigan, the legis legislatures that put this, put this legislation together decided that they would look at ecological response curves. So how does the fish population, the characteristic fish population change as you remove flow from the stream? And instead of just saying there's one point where if the, if the stream flow reduction is low, everything is good. And then once you hit a, a hard point, we've crossed a tipping point and it's now bad. They decided to make zones to help with the management of the resource within the state. So we provided these response curves that were built on the NHD plus and the response models that I we had in the previous slide, and the legislature then decided how to break these zones together to say, if your withdrawals are in this zone, then the user just has to register the use, and they can move on. If you, if the withdrawals start to move into this zone B, then you have to alert your neighbors and you have to do conservation method, uh, conservation activities. And as you move to closer and closer to this line that the that we're trying to protect, there's more responsibility of the users and then the community to manage the resource. And here's how those lines appear for those 11 different classes that I outlined on that earlier map. So this class here that's called cold transitional, they're dominated by cold fisheries, 
but they're very close to warming up and maybe losing that fishery. So the, when the legislation was finally implemented, they only allow a very little water to be removed from those systems before conservation measures need to be implemented. They built these ideas into an online screening tool to allow users to um, register new uses without having to go through a, a, a large formal permitting process. The, the advisory council that helped advise the legislature on this recognized that there's a lot of water in Michigan and many uses aren't going to have an adverse resource impact. So, the screening tool embodies the, those different models, the streamless draw model, the fisheries model, um, and, the, and the response model, and then allows users to apply for a new or increased use without um, a, long, a long process. Those Water withdrawal tools went into effect in about 2008 and 2009. And at about that same time, groups here, like co-authors and colleagues here in the Water Science Center, were asked whether we could take those same science components from Michigan and provide the same kind of information regionally. And this work was funded by the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. And the idea was, we weren't involved in a legislative process the same way we were in Michigan, but we could provide the data and the response curves and classifications that would allow people to think comprehensively across the basin and, and build management decisions on that same uh, consistent data. Again, we needed to use the NHD and the NHD plus. We used a, a different method to estimate stream flow that was even more tied to the stream network. And I'll, and I'll talk about that in future slides. But we used a stream flow model, stream temperature modeling, and again, the, the fish presence and abundance modeling. In order to estimate flow in the ungauged basins, we used a method called eighth inch, which is a constrained regression technique that explicitly tied to the NHD plus. It uses the routing information to route the mass of water that moves downstream and then check the estimates at each active gauge. So we'll do a linear regression, sum the flows down the network until we get to a gauge, and then at the gauge we'll correct the estimate by adjusting yields upstream of that gauge. So the flow information, the con connectivity information in NHD Plus became crucial to the producing the estimates um, of ungauged flows across the basin. And we've put these out now in a mapper from 1950 to 2012 flows. It produces a time series of monthly flows. And at this website, we can come in now and built on that medium res, one to 100,000 NHG plus, we can make, show estimates of the flow at any point. Here's an example of, of just one reach from that system um, that shows the monthly flows um, for this flat river, flat river site. And if there was a gauge available here, we would we provide a link that allows us to also download the gauge data. And another way to look at this information is to look at the yield or the flow from drainage area and, and look at what parts of the landscape are producing the high yields um, that, lead, that lead to the stream flow in, in the system. And what Jim McKenna and his colleagues at the Great Lakes Science Center have been doing are taking these time series of flows and relating them to, to the fish um, presence and abundance data that they have um, in their labs. 
So they looked at um, August median yields and fish data normalized to catch per unit effort to look at to develop response curves for different species across the Great Lakes. And here's an example for brook trout using the, all the records and the raw data, looking at the catch per unit effort and the number of brook trout they found in these different stream classes across the basin. And then we step back and generalize that a bit and say what we see in general is for brook trout, they're dominated in the, in the cold streams is where we see the highest abundance of these fish. And we can see where does the population respond most quickly to changes in flow. And Jim and his colleagues have labeled these the critical flow zone for each of these environments in terms of as a water man as a fisheries manager, where would you be most concerned about changes in flow because it would have the biggest impact in the population? So if you have a really cold stream and very high yield and there's some change out here, then the stream is pretty well buffered and you may not expect to see much change in the brook trout population if there's a change in, in flow as reflected by a reduction in yield. But as we start moving into this zone, then the system was, would be stressed. And then here, the change is very rapid, and this is a critical zone where you could use a, lose a lot of population for a relatively small change in flow. These were developed for a whole number of species across the Great Lakes. And then what, um, what the researchers did is take this idea and map it back to a spatial distribution to point out to, in this case, for fisheries managers for brook trout, which streams appear to have the optimal flow and temperature characteristics to support that species and then which ones would be stressed and which ones are, are critically stressed. So a fisheries manager can look and identify areas where they might, ex let's say we might expect brook trout to be here, but because of the current flow and temperature measurements, we think it might be a, a stressed stream and we might be an area we want to go in and look at in more detail to make before we make management decisions there. the last slide and, and because they're posting these uh, PowerPoints it'll be available um, for you to download from that from that main website. Thanks, that's it, Steve. Thanks. All right, thank you, Howard. Um, so we have a few minutes for questions. Again, I uh, use the Q and A button on the uh, well, I guess on the WebEx button bar or elsewhere. I'm not sure where else it'd be. Um, but use that Q&A button bar to uh, submit your questions, and we will we will record these questions. Uh, if we don't get to your question during the session today, uh, we'll post a, a written answer to the website. So we haven't had any questions come in yet. The uh, yeah, the way the thing is right now, it will be on the right hand side. There's a tab for Q&A. So, um, Howard, you, the eighth-inch uh, model that you showed was just done on the U.S. side of the Great Lakes. That's right, for the U.S. Great Lakes basin. Okay. Was there is there anything happening similar on the Canadian side? Um, I don't. Not that I know of. I know that there's you know there's work on harmonization across the boundary for. Um, the WBD and the NHD, and so I think it would be feasible to do um, if they have the uh, NHD plus connectivity. All right. Well, I guess if um, oh, go ahead. So we do have a question for Dan, I believe, on the stream internet. If we have a little bit more time. And Dan uh, uh, chatted and said that he had to move on to another meeting, so I believe he's left the call, Al. 
Oh, okay. So we can take the question and ask him offline and post the answer on the NHD website on the hydrography seminar series. Right, and there were a couple of other questions that we didn't get to that um, that we'll do that with as well. Uh, I've, I've tried to submit a question, but I've had difficulty uh, activating the send button. Uh, so one thing I was interested in is uh, uh, expanding your database to include say, uh, information from uh, bioacoustic uh, monitoring with uh, automatic uh, species identification. Have you, uh, do you do you have any any of those type of monitors included in your network? Is that a question for Dan as well? well yeah, two questions. Do you do, do you uh, have access or interest in bioacoustic monitoring uh, as an indicator of stream and ecosystem health? And did you hear me? <laughs> Fair enough. Yes, we did hear you, Dave. And uh, we will uh, uh, forward that question to Dan. He had to uh, duck out to another meeting. Thank you. Uh, what was the uh, temporal resolution of your uh, uh, data, the temperature data that was predicting stream temperatures to, was it uh, 0.6 degrees centigrade? Was that daily values or annual averages or uh, is that still also about the, the the Norwest stream temperature modeling? Right. Okay. Again, we'll have to uh, forward that on to Dan um, and get you get that back later. Um, there was a question um, from uh, I believe this is about the eighth inch model. Um, it's, to what extent can you link high yield area delineations to groundwater conditions, and how are those linkages made? In the uh, in the AFINCH method, there's an underlying uh, regression model, and that relies um, usually on some geology or soils in input information. So, um, so the the uh, Link was made through a, a geology layer that had like outwash sand as a, as a characteristic that would be a high yield area, and then the regression model would expect would, would estimate high yield for those reaches that are dominated by that geology. Okay, thanks. Can I do one oh. more question, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Uh, there was another question on the. Uh, National Stream Internet, we'll pass that on to Dan. And there was a question about a deadline for questions that will be answered. So we'll leave the question and answer panel up here for a few minutes, uh, probably 10 minutes. So even after the webinar is, is finished, you will leave it open for a little while longer. And Allison has a poll for you that she'll open up now which is just a couple of questions for you. I think three questions for the attendees just uh, about what you found useful and what we could do better next time, that kind of thing. And those will be open uh, also for about 10 minutes. All right, so thanks for attending, everyone. Uh, I'll point out we, have, we do have another session planned. The theme of that session will be elevation hydrography integration. So at that with that, I think, you know, thanks to Dan and Howard for the presentations and thanks for participating. Uh, and please do take a couple minutes to fill out the poll questions so we can try to do this, uh, make this better the next time. All right. So thanks, everyone.